Hi. So uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for coming to my talk. Thank you, uh, the organizing committee, for giving me this opportunity to share my research here at the annual LLL Graduate Student Conference. It is my great pleasure to be giving this talk in this webinar format. Uh, this is my very first time to give a presentation in this mode. And to be honest, it's quite a challenging probably to present uh, my research without seeing the audience's faces and not using body languages um, or facial expressions so much. Uh, but at least I, I get to present from my comfy Simpson background room. So uh, I hope this presentation goes well. Yeah, let me switch my um, screen to my slide. So um, my presentation today is the relational turn in applied linguistics. And I've decided to put a question mark here. Why do I have it? As many of you are aware, paradigm shifts are often called turns to mark new movements in a field. For example, in second language acquisition, there was a social turn in the late 1990s, followed by the multilingual turn, uh, the affective turn, and the trans turn et cetera, et cetera, in recent years. Frankly speaking, there have been so many terms discussed in SLA already, so I have a slight hesitation in adding a new term because it loses its original sense. The main point of my presentation is to call for the broadening of applied linguistics research, in particular SLA research, to include systematic investigation of human relations by using the framework of social network analysis. However, this framework, or any framework for that matter, is not without a problem or challenges. I would also like to address these challenges as well. The question mark here then is uh, meant to invite critical and constructive feedback and comments from the audience so that we can further explore potentials and caveats of social network analysis as a viable framework for applied linguistics research. Uh, let me start this talk by giving you an idea of how social networks are relevant in many aspects of our lives. This is a brief summary of my academic and professional background. I was born and raised in Tokyo, Japan, went to Japanese schools up to my undergraduate uh, training, and then came over to the States for my graduate training in Japanese language and pedagogy. Uh, and I got my MA from Purdue and PhD from Wisconsin. Then I moved to New York City to start teaching as a language lecturer. After five years of teaching there, I moved to Kentucky and taught undergraduate courses. Last fall, I started teaching here at UH Manoa. The reason why I'm telling my background right now is not because it's interesting per se. It, it's quite probably boring for, for the majority of people here. But rather, it is because these events in my life are clearly reflected in the social networks I have formed and been part of over the years. In order to show this, I created this diagram. This graph is created by extracting friend connection data from my Facebook account. Obviously, it does not cover the entire list of my friends on Facebook or in real life but it does schematically show a fraction of my social network. As you can see, the individuals who are congregated largely reflect my past affiliations and their mutual connections. And each group has some overlaps. Right here. Okay. Uh, Facebook does not allow me to extract all my connection data, but if, you, if I could see the entire network, it will, uh, clearly show how my relationships were built with groups related to one another based on my academic, professional, and personal activities from which we can visually see my lifelong socialization process. Um, this is the network of characters that appeared in Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. Uh, human relations are obviously relevant in the fictional world as well, although it is perhaps uncommon to see literally works analyzed this way. 
The authors of this study noted that the network structures and features represented here resemble closely those found in real world. And the concept of network is very timely now in the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is a visual representation of how an infectious disease transmits through people's connections. This graph is not a coronavirus infection model. It is a uh, tuberculosis TB outbreak that happened in Southwest America over 10 years ago. However, it shows a similar transmission pattern leading to clusters from one single person. STD transmission network, for example, would look very different from this. So social networks are ubiquitous and can be found in many aspects of our lives. For example, a brain is a network of neurons and firms are networks of individuals passing along information, orders and coordinating efforts. Economies are networks of firms and other agents buying and selling. Countries contain many networks, transportation systems, and phone systems. Ecosystems are networks of species eating each other, creating environments for each other, etc. And obviously the internet is a network. And in terms of its relevance to so applied linguistics, this last point here is particularly important. So societies and networks. Society has been discussed quite often in recent SLA research, but I feel that it is not clearly conceptualized on analytical premises. And this is the reason why I got interested in this topic. In fact, many social theories that have been frequently used to frame SLA research appear to conceptualize human relationships as integral to the understanding of language use and development. Because each theory has its own ontological and epistemological roots, each theory conceptualizes human relationships differently. For example, Vygotskyan social cultural theory uh, and its concept of DPD, zone of proximal development, presumes that uh, the developmental process of a less knowledgeable person, such as children and learners, with the assistance provided by more knowledgeable others, such as adults, teachers, and peers. Similarly, Levin Wenger's communities of, communities of Practice Framework emphasizes apprenticeship model as its basis and tries to capture how newcomers in a community change their participation as they go through the process of becoming old timers. While these frameworks provide useful theoretical perspectives, they did not get into details of human relationship beyond what appears to be presumed by the theories. In the above examples, for example, hierarchical relationships are mostly stressed for the illustration of how development occurs. In order to better understand the process of second language use and development, the complexity and the subtlety of human relationship should be more actively examined in our empirical research. I believe that social network analysis or shortened form SNA can serve as a great analytical framework to dig into these understudied objects of applied linguistics. So uh, what is a network? A network is an analytic concept rather than a theoretical one. This means that a network can be identified with empirical data sets then notions such as society, community, and culture can be re-specified with network concepts. A network consists of a set of actors, which can be individuals, organizations, locations, events, and so forth, and relational ties that exist among them. However, a network is more than a set of ties. It involves paths that are created by the ties, and the path are where stuff happens. Stuff as in many different things. It is often the analyst's job to look closely into what is taking place in these paths, such as social interaction, social influence, social diffusion, resource information flaws, and so forth. 
Social network analysis was born in sociology and has been applied into many disciplinary fields. It has been popularized in the late 1990s with the wake of relational sociology. In fact, this new development in sociology has been called the relational term. In this par new paradigm, relational characteristics characteristics are emphasized rather than individual attributes. For example, age is usually considered as individual attributes in traditional sociology, also traditional SLA, but in SNA, it can be conceptualized on a relational term, such as John is younger than Mary by five years, or John and Mary are the same age, and so forth. As ECOT 2018 explained, relational sociology is not bound by particular theories or analytical strategies. He wrote, quote, the diversity of ontological and methodological starting points allows scholars to investigate a wide range of phenomena. This diversity, complexity, depth, and vitality enable dialogue and debate without requiring consensus. What binds them together is their scholarly focus on relations rather than alignment with a specific empirical object and or method of inquiry, end of quote. Similarly, the development of graph theory in mathematics contributed to the advancement of SNA software to create social network graphs. The complex visualization of networks made spatial temporal representations of network configuration possible and easy. So where can we find the applications of SNA in our field? Social linguistics research, specifically in the area of linguistic variations, has actively incorporated some sort of network concepts. Uh, for example, James and Leslie Moroy's seminal research examined vernacular English spoken in three working class communities in Belfast in Northern Ireland. Beyond the social linguistic research, we have seen a surge of research using social network concepts in SLA, especially in the context of study abroad over the past decade or so. These studies have examined how study abroad sojourners handle their interpersonal relationships while abroad and how that affected their language use and development. My own research also looked into this aspect. As the title indicates, I used uh, social network analysis and conversation analysis as the main analytical framework in this project. SNA was used to examine interpersonal relationships while CA was used to describe social interaction. The main objective of my study was to address a broad question of how study abroad participants undergo various social processes. I had three phases of analysis set for this project. The first phase is the analysis of network formation and transformation in three different summer programs in Japan. The second phase is concerned with the process of interpersonal development by individuals in these programs. And the third phase was focused on the microanalysis of social interaction engaged by these individuals. I collected various types of data for this study. Social network surveys constitute a major source of, uh, of data for SNA. Here. And conversational recordings constitute a major source of data for CA. And all other ethnographic information or interview data served as a glue, more or less, to tie the, these two different data sets in my analysis. This is the survey that I created uh, for the social network uh, survey. This is the cover sheet in which all participants filled out their background information, such as name, uh, hometown, home university, et cetera, et cetera, and their motivation as well. And this is the part where participants reported their network co uh, connections. I asked um, four relational questions here. One, uh, did you know this person prior to this program? Uh, this taps into pre-existing relationships. Do you consider this person as a friend or someone who you would like to hang out with in your spare time? This is a friendship index. 
How close do you feel to this person? This is a closeness index. And how often did you interact with this person beyond the classroom since you arrived in Japan? This is the interaction index. Each index points to different aspects of socialization. And um, each program participant was asked to rate their relationships with each other, each of the other participants. And they were also asked to add more names if they met someone beyond the program in Japan and to rate their relationship with them similarly. So they had, for, for each name here, they were asked to indicate the relationship. The survey was done in each of the three programs in the beginning and the end of the program. And all responses were plotted in Excel file like this and exported to the visualization software called Giphy. This is the interface of Giphy. Giphy is a free software which allows us to create network graphs like this. In addition to numerous options for visualization, such as changing the nodal size and color quote, according to certain attributes, we can also conduct various analyses, such as identifying centrality scores, calculating the density, cohesiveness, and other characteristics of a network, and detecting substructures of the network, which is shown here by color coding. I studied three summer language intensive programs in Japan. These programs were all located in the western part of Japan. Program A is US-based organization and open to everyone. It lasted eight weeks and had 30 students. And the host university was a small private college and the level of courses offered were higher beginner to advanced and their housing arrangement, apartments with Japanese roommates. And this is the important part, 24 language pledge was enforced to the learners, the students. And program B, host university runs this program and open to students in affiliated schools, lasted for eight weeks and had 54 students. Only beginner students were there, and apartment or home stay could be chosen depending on the needs. There's no language policy like program A. Uh, host university runs program C and open to anyone, and this is a slightly shorter program, six weeks. And uh, again, uh, it's a open to beginner level, and they offered dormitory with Japanese roommates, and there's no language policies. So I wanted to study multiple programs here uh, because I could conduct comparative analysis, how the environmental settings affect the ways in which uh, networks were created and how that affected language use and development. So there are numerous differences here in terms of settings and program design features. Therefore, the first question I wanted to answer was how social networks were formed in these programs and how the differences can be accounted for. This is a graph of program A network based on the closeness index. Each circle represents an individual actors. Here, so in individual actors. Um, Red nodes are program participants, uh, whereas blue nodes are, represent their roommates. The green nodes are others beyond the program, uh, people associated with the program. Red arrows indicate ties between individuals. In this case, if the person indicated some degree of closeness to the person, that is represented as an arrow. The thicker the line is, the stronger the connection is meaning very close as opposed to plain close. We can see many ties connecting most participants in this program, both study abroad students and their Japanese roommates. This means that people feel close with one another overall, and we see a tight knit community in this program. But there are not many other people in, involved in this network beyond the program boundary. 
So I call this a uh, closed type network. If we compare program A with the other programs, the differences become very clear. This is program B network with the closeness index. There is so many uh, connections among the program participants in this network as well. However, there are also many unique ties or so-called pendants here in this network. Uh, pendants are connections that only one person keeps in the network. In other words, pendants are not shared by other people in the network. In this network, pendants are host families denoted with letter H and local Japanese students they met on campus denoted with letter O. Um, some students chose to live with a host family, whereas others lived in an apartment. And those who do not have any pendants are tightly connected with other program participants. Like here, these people are connected with each other, whereas these people have both internal ties and also out external ties as well. Now compare this with uh, program A. This network looks more expensive beyond the program boundary due to the presence of many pendants. So it's an open type network. This is program C network. It's quite different from the other two. It has the fewest participants, first of all, only seven. And as you can see, there are not many connections among the participants, unlike the first two networks. Largely, two groups exist here, here um, each of which has pendants, pendants and pendants. And so they are more or less independent from one another in this respect. There are also individuals who do not belong to any of these groups and who do not have connections beyond the program either, such as Lucy. Lucy has only one here. <laughs> um, she actually ended up being alone and reported not having been able to make any friends in Japan. This network is not functioning as a, co as a cohesive community, so it is a collapsed type network. As seen with the contrastive shapes of network graphs, these uh, focal programs were very different in terms of how participants built relationship with each other. The differences can be accounted for uh, by many factors, but the environmental factors as well as program design features are clearly reflecting the patterns of interpersonal development observed in these programs. For example, program A enforced 24-hour language pledge, which prohibits students from speaking English. The program had the Japanese roommates who are living together with the study abroad students. Uh, they also had, uh, had to uh, sign the pledge. Um, so not just the US students, but also Japanese roommates had to keep to this language pledge. This is to enforce the pledge as strictly as possible, even at home. This language policy and other program features encourage program participants um, to hang out with one another all the time, which led to a tight-knit group. The students did not seem to venture out to meet other local students beyond the program. On the other hand, program B does not have any language policy. There are not many organized activities either. This is, there is no common lounge space where people can gather and interact either. The only uh, place they can hang around on campus is the cafeteria, where other local students are also present. This setting helped some students, only some students, to meet local students and make friends with them. Their network was open and expansive this way. Program C was small in number, but also the backgrounds of the participants were all very diverse. Students came not only from the USA, but also from other countries such as Israel and uh, India. One student, Lucy, who remained alone, was also a non-traditional student aged 59. Therefore, their cultural diversity as well as age differences appear to have kept them from forming a cohesive group despite the small size. The host university was a foreign language university with many international students, so students had numerous chances to meet local, uh, local Japanese students on campus as well. 
without trying to uh, train so hard. Now, uh, in order to see how individuals' experiences were shaped variously, I chose to focus on certain individuals and examine how they develop their interpersonal relationships with, uh, within and beyond the program. In SNA, centrality of actors is an important analytical concept to see how individuals have differential access to the information and resources, as well as support and influence. Similarly, the substructure of the network also provides us a way to look into what kinds of sharedness or homophily is operating in grouping. In addition, I also wanted to see how their positioning in the respect, uh, respective networks may have contributed to the interactional engagement during the program, which led to their language use and development. So I will focus on two students in program A, Rose and Joe, in this presentation. Rose was a very extroverted student. She gained popularity and prominence in the program in week one. The size of the node here represents in degree centrality, meaning how many ties each person received from others. So as you can see, Rose is uh, the gained the most uh, ties from others in the program. Many people in the program felt close to Rose. Prominent individuals may wield power over others. So Rose can wield her power over others because she has many connections, but it may also be susceptible, uh, susceptible to the influences from others. So she gets a lot of influences from other people. As we will see soon, Rose's interactional behavior was also influenced by her surrounding individuals. Let's look at her language use in social interaction. I cannot show detailed transcripts here due to the time constraints. So I will simply give you a snapshot of her interactional pattern here. Her prominence in the program may give us sense that she's a very extroverted uh, person and use Japanese actively all the time, a kind of image that everybody assumes for outspoken individuals. As a matter of fact, she was clearly determined to stick with the use of Japanese by making Japanese friends and talking to them all the time, according to her narrative in the first interview I conducted with her. However, her actual language use was more intricate and it gradually changed halfway through presumably because of her unique position in the network. First, she was frequently observed in group settings with many friends around, and she was engaged largely in multi-party conversations. In order to keep being part of the conversations happening in the lounge space, for example, she frequently joined conversations with multiple people simultaneously. This picture shows a typical way when she, in which she participated in interaction in the lounge space. So Rose is here and there's people surrounding her, people come and go, and that is a very typical uh, way of uh, interaction in this program. At least. As you can see, she joined surrounding conversations as much as possible. This is, um, this is a schematic uh, representation of how she switched between conversations. As you can see, um, she joined, withdrew, and rejoined these conversations repeatedly, namely 15 times. The number here indicates the shift that happened in the interaction. So zero, so this is the first, uh, when I started recording, this is when she, the conversation she was part of. And then she switched to this one and then come back and some people joined and uh, so there are multiple uh, shifts that we observed. Uh, in this way, she presented herself as always uh, present in multiple conversations. This requires spe special linguistic and other resources. Rose was particularly good at turn-taking turn in multi-party conversations using various resources, such as discourse markers, paralinguistic markers, and interpersonal knowledge that she possessed. And despite the fact, uh, this is despite the fact that she was not fully participating in the conversation. 
It should be noted that shifting participation in multiple conversation means that her engagement in each conversation was inevitably very short. Her language choice was also noteworthy. She was very persistent in using Japanese in the very beginning, but she started using English after midway through in the program after her friends decided to resort to English despite her initial commitment uh, to keep keeping to the language pledge. So these people started breaking the pledge collectively, and these people were initially affected. She eventually realized that she needed to use English to build deeper relationships with other American students because she cannot do so with Japanese students using Japanese. Her aforementioned interactional behavior would probably not give enough opportunities to engage in deeper topical conversations either. So uh, again, around week, of, week three of the program, her circle of friends decided to go against the pledge uh, collectively. And this threat breaking was done first among a small group of people, but then it spread out to the entire group. By the end of the program, almost everyone, but a few students started using English. And because her proximity to these initial oathbreakers and her status in a network, Rose was one of the first people who learned about the pledge breaking. And she initially did, did not sympathize with them, but eventually she started using English. As a comparison, <clears throat> some students who were placed remotely, like Joe here, did not get affected or did not know about the pledge breaking until the very end. So, uh, in fact, Joe was in many respects the opposite of Rose. Joe was seen as a very quiet and, and introverted student. His lack of prominence in the network was evidenced in its in-degree centrality here, it's a very small node of size. He did not stay in the lounge area after school. He would not, uh, he would often go home and um, he, uh, he's, he was overall the least popular student in the program. His isolation from the groups was so obvious that his teacher was worried if he had a chance to use Japanese outside the classroom. On the contrary, he had numerous chances to speak Japanese with limited individuals. He limited his interaction uh, to two individuals in the program, his housemate, Jiro, and his classmate, Ethan. And he en engaged in daily conversations with them, either at home or on our way to and from school. Although, or because he limited his interaction with these two individuals, he was often engaged in long topical conversations in which he was given opportunities to engage in complex pragmatic handling, such as third party complaints. Also, it is interesting to note that his interaction with Jiro was different from when he interacted with Ethan. For example, Ethan and Joe were co-constructing their conversations with the shared orientation to each other's epistemic resources while Jiro, was, uh, Jiro and Joe were engaged in interaction with differential access to knowledge. By and large, Joe's experience with social interaction was quite diverse and extensive, despite the ostensible appearance of his introverted demeanor. So program environment was clearly relevant in the formation of different types of social networks. And the positioning in a social network presents different access to the resources and influences which interact with individuals' unique dispositions and orientations. My research peeked into such a cyclical process of socialization. So this is a snapshot of my study, but what can SNA bring to SLA research at large? Social interaction is undoubtedly inseparable from relational aspects. So in order to fully understand the process of second language use and development, both should be placed emphasis in research. I think that SNA allows multi-level analysis of sociality by bringing in a meso or macro level analytical perspective, which is often neglected in the microanalysis of social interaction. As I said in the beginning, there are also challenges uh, with this framework as well. As a versatile analytical bundle, there are different ways of collecting data and analyzing data in SNA. However, data collection often presents a challenge in SNA. 
More specifically, collecting information on network connections from individuals may pose issues of access, reliability, and validity at time. Although there are different aspects to analyze, an emphasis on structural analysis may often be seen as incompatible with some of the post-structuralist approaches in SLA. Moreover, although SNA is suitable to both quantitative and qualitative analysis, visualization of network itself <clears throat> relies largely on algorithms that the software uses, which poses technical challenges as well. So before I end this talk, I would like to introduce a quote by one of the big figures in relational sociology. Um, Society is not a space containing relations or an arena where relations are played. It is rather the very issue of relations. That is, society is relation and not, does not have relations. The relational turn does not mean a turn away from language, but it is a turn to the more holistic view of language use and development. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hatsu. Thank you, Dr. Hasegawa. Um, uh, we have about 12 minutes left for question and answer. And right now you already have two question or two or three questions in the question and answer session. Uh, for those of you who are audience members, if you would like to um, post a question, just click on Q&A and post your question in there and we'll uh, answer them as it permits. So can I get to answer these questions or is that how it works? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Just okay, whichever so, one. Okay, so the one question that I got is, could you clarify if the directionality of arrows in network maps carry meaning? And if so, how that is coded and carried through in analysis? And the answer is yes, the directionality of arrows is, uh, is carry meaning, meaning that, so person A, shows person B to be close, then the direction goes this way. But because I asked everyone the same question, it could potentially give this way too. It could be one way, it could be mutual, and it does make a difference in terms of influence uh, because uh, if the person relies on this person and the direction goes this way, for example, social support, uh, if the person uh, is relying on this person and the social support is getting uh, going coming from this person to this person and that uh, detailed analysis is actually important in SNA as well, not just the overall shapes of networks. Uh, does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, is there a way to get a uh, so can I just go on or, Jim? Yes, go it? ahead. I, okay. I, will, I will mark the previous one as answered. Okay, so yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, so the second question, thank you for the inspiring presentation. Uh, it was a whole new area to know how social network analysis and conversation analysis can be both adopted for this study abroad study. I would like to know a little bit about more about the relationship of these two methods in your project. Thank you. <clears throat> this is a very good question. And I think this is a question that I always keep thinking about because CA has a very special, specific, and more or less clear uh, epistemological roots, which is uh, ethnomethodology and um, relies pretty much on the first hand experience of uh, participants, multiple participants, not just one person, but multiple participants. So um, I think that it is, um, so when I was writing a monograph, I got the question, how these two frameworks are compatible. And I, my reaction was that CA is, it's very strong and powerful as a methodological framework and also theoretical framework, but then it, it's lacking in the uh, explanatory power beyond what is observable. And that's where SNA comes in. Um, um, 
So I, I think these two frameworks, frameworks compensate each other by looking at very micro uh, part of sociality versus looking at a more macro level or meso level, which is also not observable uh, because one person can only see their surrounding. Uh, like a face, my Facebook example, you wouldn't be able to see your entire network ever because you are already embedded in a social network. So I think it's kind of important for us as a researcher to dig out that aspect or meso level uh, social relations so that, <clears throat> and there are influences from those bigger level um, perspectives. So um, yes, uh, and I understand that there are still probably a little hesitation in using combining these two frameworks at the same time. So I think this is the question that I have to always keep in mind and also maybe defend better in the future. Okay, um, that's my answer. <laughs> okay, so the next question. It looks like you spent some time at each of the sites. Yes. Can you say something about that, please? Ethnographic data collection over time. Yes. So I spent, so these three programs are kind of close in terms of geographic location. So I could actually go to each program like daily. Uh, so I try to be there as much as possible during the duration of the program. Uh, and I got actually well acquainted with the participants and their friends over time. That's how I got information about um, their experiences while, although I was not a part of their program per se, I try to present myself as someone who's there all the time and uh, not trying to be a researcher per se, but as, a, as an adult acquaintance. Uh, it was, uh, I was lucky to, to be given access to those sites. Uh, it was pure coincidence and my, well, this actually, my networks gave me this opportunity to access to the data, but uh, I collected, uh, so I observed their <clears throat> activities outside the classroom. Uh, I interviewed a lot of people and I got uh, to, uh, yeah, I got to see I got to hear and see a lot of things. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. And the next question. Thank you for your presentation. What does your uh, research suggest about the overall value of language pledge in programs in classroom? It's a very good question. And I think um, it's really difficult to answer whether it's a good or not uh, because it depends on the purposes. But in terms of promoting uh, basic social interaction and relationship building, pledge obviously um, kept people from getting to know each other. And that was clearly shown in program A. Therefore, I would go against the pledge if that is the primary goal for the study abroad to get to know people and promote social interaction, experience, and so forth. Uh, but I have experienced teaching at Middlebury College, uh, which is known for strong, strict pledge. And they are there for that. So for that, I think I'm not really against it. Um, yeah, so that's that. Thank you, that's it, uh, for your great presentation. Is there any SNA study that focused on examining the relationship between the informant's SN social network and the proficiency in the target language, especially in the heritage language acquisition development context? And uh, yes, there are uh, some uh, studies that actually many SNA related studies were chose to go with a quantitative uh, analysis more or less than qualitative analysis that I chose to do, uh, meaning that they try to count the numbers and how extensive their networks are and how that affected their proficiency levels. And I'm not particularly sure about the heritage language context, but it's, it's really difficult to identify what the context is sometimes. Uh, 
it could be heritage speakers sometimes depending on the subject but sometimes it's it's uh, just a pure study abroad context but uh, in general uh, quantitative analysis is very tricky because you can't just count the number of uh, people in the network and see that okay this is extensive network so it helped uh, language acquisition uh, I think it's more important to look into the qualitative aspect of uh, network, which I think is, is should be the way to go for research. So in that respect, I think the, the, the findings are very um, uh, inconclusive in a way. Okay, thank you. Um, to what extent do you think these two social interaction and personal relationship contribute to students' language achievements on the social linguistic and pragmatic perspectives? Okay, so when it comes to pragmatic perspectives, I think uh, a lot of past studies, for example, uh, Cook 2008 did study on uh, uh, speech styles by study abroad participants in a home state context and so forth. So. Um, study abroad and personal relationship you know in a language socialization traditional language uh, socialization paradigm which means that uh, parent child more advanced less advanced kind of relationship would have a lot of uh, impact on pragmatic perspectives especially native speaker non-native speaker context uh, but in terms of my context where students were talking, uh, not just talking to Japanese students, but, you know, just people in general. Um, there were a lot of uh, issues that I wanted to focus on, but I try to focus on interactional aspects, meaning the interactional competence, not necessarily just uh, specifically on pragmatic uh, aspects, uh, but on how their uh, interaction was con constructed uh, and so forth. So I think this detailed analysis of personal relationship may, I, I think it will contribute to the understanding of pragmatic perspective uh, or pragmatic development, but I, my study did not necessarily focus on that aspect. Uh, it will probably be very interesting to see how friends network, for example, may have contributed to the development of certain uh, registers or styles of uh, students L2. Okay, uh, I think it's that is, okay.